The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. I'm John Tracy. I'm with ITG. Welcome, everyone. Today's webinar is PCI 4.0, the new requirements and how to comply. Again, welcome. Um, let's go ahead and start. And if you want, there is a, um, a chat window for questions after we finish. And I'll be glad to go through those with you. If I may, um, ITG, uh, we have 20 years of experience and well over 200 employees in compliance, both PCI, ISO, SOC, and others as well. Uh, we specialize in IT governance, risk management, and compliance solutions with more than 12,000 clients across six continents. So those of you with um, international operations, um, we are certainly capable, we believe, of being able to support um, your compliance requirements. And again, we have done more than 1,000 penetration tests that have been delivered, and we certainly would like a chance to, to chat with you for uh, your requirements for, uh, for pen penetration, excuse me, penetration testing and vulnerability testing as well. All right, moving on. Um, my experience and my background, again, I'm John Tracy. I'm a GRC consultant. Um, I have worked in the payment card industry for well over 10 years. I've supported PCI versions 2.0 to 4.0. I have 15 years experience in transactional compliance, point of sale environments and architecture, as well as internal and external PCI, DSS auditing, compliance consultancy, training, and PCI program development. I personally have developed um, two new programs from the uh, Greenfield um, for um, clients of mine, um, and they've been quite successful, and they're able to turn that into um, a repeatable process, um, making them <clears throat> very successful. I've got 15 years experience in information security engineering, operations, and architecture. Um, my graduate work is in my computer science, but my focus is is log analysis and statistical analysis. Um, I'm spending quite a bit of time reviewing log and log analysis, looking for vulnerabilities, for breaches, uh, and nefarious activities. And finally, I have a background in financial services, um, uh, contact or call centers, and healthcare. Uh, I've worked for uh, major uh, financial services companies um, in both an engineering role and in a compliance engineer and SOC uh, manager role. All right, let's move on. All right, this is our, going to be our agenda questions for today. The first one, payment security landscape and how it affects our organizations, your organization. Specifically, um, what is, is best practices? Um, what is, is well known about um, current issues as related to security and, and breaches and nefarious activities and things of that nature? Number two, the new PCI reviews and 4 requirements and how they may benefit your organization. Um, 4.0 is now live, if you will, and so um, you will be held accountable um, for the requirements in there, and we're going to go through what those requirements uh, will look like moving forward, and potentially, if I can, what they may look like over the horizon. Number three, the challenges organizations may face with PCI, many of these and <clears throat> excuse me, following questions will all pretty much cross-pollinate to one another. Number four, the steps to prepare for PCI compliance, and that's version 4.0. And finally, practical advice and solutions to help you implement and comply with the standard. As I said, I have a chat window. If you'd like to put questions in there, we will then review them um, at the end of the presentation. And also then I would like to uh, cover some of the um, offerings that um, ITG offers um, for PCI and programs that may be a benefit to your organization. All right, with that, let's move forward. First one again is payment security landscape and how it affects organizations. All right, um, the, the payment landscape um, is challenging. Digital transactions are the foundation of the modern online economy. And the issue for all e-commerce organizations, online in-store retailers, payment providers and card issuers or card processors is how to address fraud and the resulting losses. Um, as you know, and, and I think it's, it's pretty clear, more and more um, PCI 4.0 was written with the um, encouragement, if you want to say, of the um, financial services industry, but especially the card processors and card issuers. Um, as you know from um, your clients, um, 
the card issuers um, have historically stood in and, and pay back uh, losses for, for your card holders. Um, but more and more uh, card holders and, and uh, card issuers are pushing back um, that if you are PCI compliant or if you're not PCI compliant, that they don't have a uh, legal or fiduciary duty. We'll discuss that in a little bit. But more and more as we move forward, PCI compliant doesn't guarantee um, success within the transactional area, but it certainly gives you um, a breadth of knowledge and, and, uh, and uh, if you will, um, an industry um, and, and uh, a domain uh, that can be a very great benefit. Um, move on. Uh, the increased threats to the payment landscape impact the overall industry space, online computer applications, supporting digital transactions, payment applications for both computer and mobile platforms, and in-store retail point-of-sale transactions. As you know, and it should be no surprise to anyone, um, the percentage of, of Americans, and we're just going to focus on America right now, 82% um, of Americans, of consumers, um, are using digital transactions. They are going online, they're going on their phone, and even some, um, if you will, some smart watches uh, are able to, if you will, um, download your card and be able to swipe accordingly. With that, uh, the biggest growth, and there should be no surprise to anyone, is mobile platforms. Um, cell phones, tablets, things of that nature. Um, and with that and the growth of that, um, payment applications, things of that nature. So as you see, nefarious activities and, and, and nefarious actors are focusing as much on mobile, if anything else, and in fact, significantly more. Because more and more mobile devices are the platform for uh, POS transactions. Um, however, they, they, whether they're applications or logging into your bank's website. So hardening, updating antivirus, anti-malware uh, applications on your cell phone, especially, um, can only be a benefit. Um, and so that's something that, um, as your clients go forward, um, chatting with them about best practices. The most dynamic threats to payment security are from mobile platforms. And again, we just talked about that. I can't emphasize enough. Um, I have been in the infosec industry for some time, and I go to the larger uh, conferences, DEF CON and Black Hat, especially DEF CON. Um, some of those presentations, and they're online, um, really paint a, a, a picture of, of cell phones, of both um, Apple iOS as well as Android. Um, as being as not as secure as you'd hoped. Um, if I may, um, iPhones especially, um, many of the ideas was that one did not need anti-malware, things of that nature. Uh, that has proven to be incorrect, that there are breaches and there are bots uh, for the Apple uh, operating system. We'll discuss that more, but again, I want to emphasize, version 4.0 and the following versions on are going to focus as much on mobile as any other platforms. And then how best practices from a PCI DSS perspective, version four and then version uh, coming after that, focusing on how to secure mobile devices for your clients and then how they um, can benefit themselves by catching, hardening, um, best practices, things of that nature. We'll discuss that more in detail. Next slide, if you will. Um, here are the, payment, the primary threats to the payment industry uh, are the same as historical trends and implementation. These are, at least um, uh, from the overall PCI perspective, are pretty much understood uh, historically. And, and I know that we all have seen them, so I just want to go over them. But I also want to reiterate um, just how important historical um, remediation techniques and best practices um, really are essential. Um, first one, of course, is operating systems. Must be hardened, removing unnecessary reports and protocols, excuse me, ports and protocols and services. I can't emphasize this enough, and certainly many, if not all of you on this call, are aware of that. Um, if you do not harden your image, both on your desktops or laptops, and especially on your mobile devices, you allow um, the fairest actors to be able to, to access your, in, your infrastructure, uh, be able to gather data, uh, and even more so uh, concerning is to spoof or, or to uh, present themselves as, as the, the owner of the device and be able to make um, purchases on the actual cell phone themselves, um, behaving as and, and pretending to be and spoofing the actual user. Um, this is well known uh, as far as, as hardening devices 
and hardening images. Um, it's been around for certainly a very long time. I just want to reiterate that is still relevant today. Uh, this helps to create a hardened OS image or a golden image. After extensive testing and deploying OS specific versions to all InScope desktops, laptops, and mobile devices. Now, if you're an organization with um, uh, call centers or things of that nature, or if you're a card processor, or if you're um, even a card issuer, uh, this is, is something that's been known to you for some time. I certainly get that, um, but I still can't emphasize enough um, hardening your images, asking your, your people to harden their image, your um, desktops or internal, and then best practices to your clients um, is something that should be, um, if not today, should be something that you're reaching out to your clients about. Moving on, um, the basis of that then is consistent and aggressive patch management systems and programs. Uh, I know that I'm speaking to a choir here, so uh, please forgive me, but patching is, is a very easy and low-hanging fruit. Um, assigning or, excuse me, um, subscribing to a vendor um, uh, patch management um, emails and, and their services, knowing when patches coming out, the classic Microsoft Tuesdays, things of that nature. But just as important is zero day. Um, I don't hear that much about zero day so much anymore. Um, it's more of a zero hour at times. Um, but the nefarious actors are out there. And if, if patching is not something that is a priority, um, that's something that um, really could help your businesses accordingly. And PCI, um, speaking for them um, for this version, um, strongly recommends that. A strong, robust patching program, um, and then validation of, of scanning of what images, excuse me, what images are patched correctly, which ones are not. So this is a two-handed, if you will, one aggressive patching, and then following up with a patch management scanning. Uh, are, my, um, are my devices patched correctly? What versions, what still needs to be patched? All that is best practice. Moving on, excuse me, if you will, the, the, the third leg of the triad, a robust logging program based on prioritizing high-risk production systems, pushing all event information and incident logging to a centralized logging system. Again, let me again repeat that. A logging system allows you to gather um, the evidence of, of your daily activities within your environment as well as any, anything else. Um, you'll get um, all kinds of, of, of events, you'll get informational events, you'll get uh, security incidents, things of that nature. Having a robust logging program can only be an essential piece um, to the overall triad. Triad being hardening your images, aggressive patching, and then aggressive and, and, and if you will, robust um, logging. Um, and again, logging systems are, are fairly straightforward and I'll go through them very quickly. Um, event logging from a Windows system, things of that nature, or logs being pulled into a centralized logging or syslog server, and then utilities or applications that then take that information and turn it into uh, dashboards and things of that nature. Um, I have personally worked in Splunk for some time. I personally like Splunk, but there are many vendors. Um, but with that, they all provide, um, I think, a real value, and I'm sure that you uh, out there also believe that, that Knowing your logging, being able to then qualify the logs, uh, what thresholds, what types of, of logs are being done, and then the alerts that are generated for specific, you certainly want to, wouldn't want to alert from informational, uh, but you certainly might want to for um, login failures, <clears throat> login attempts, timeframes, things of that, and then of course for security incident management. Uh, that goes without saying. Moving on from there, alerts generated from the centralized logging solutions are sent to an IC security operation and system admins for review. This is, is clearly understood. Whether it's being done or not, I certainly will defer to, to the owners of the organizations. But having a system that allows alerts to be queued up to have sys admins, um, SOC uh, admins, um, or even NOC admins to be able to see those alerts in either in an email or on a dashboard or on um, uh, the applications. Uh, Splunk and things of that nature is essential. Therefore, you know what's happening. You know when it's happening real time. You're able to, and your people are able to grab it, um, review it, triage it, uh, investigate it, um, and then either start working it as as escalated, or to be able to then uh, dismiss it as as a false positive. But again, how alerts are handled, how are they queued up, who then they go to, 
and then the next steps as far as triage, uh, forensics, uh, if you will, a classic security incident event management um, system is essential to this. Moving on from there, a, a strong change in incident management ticketing system, um, whether ServiceNow or Remedy or JIRA, um, the ability to document tickets, to identify tickets, to assign tickets, uh, I think is essential. And as you look through PCI, that is required. Um, it's been required now for since at least version 2.0 and certainly, of course, in version 4. And then final, information security policies and standards reflecting the PCI DSS program and best practices. Specifically, and I think we all are aware, um, if you've gone through a PCI audit or if you've gone through an ISO audit or any of that, um, your external auditor is going to say, okay, show me your, your policies. Show me your, your information security policy. Show me your information security um, standards. Um, what is your change management policy? What is your incident management policy? What is your uh, business continuation program policy? All of those are essential um, from the certification perspective. They're also essential from a business perspective as far as best practices. Um, and I think that goes without saying. And again, much of this information is exactly um, best practices and from a historical, uh, if you will, focus. I certainly am not saying that I'm reinventing the wheel here, but I just wanted to review best practices that are still relevant today and how they may be updated in, for 4.0 and beyond. We can finally, um, my favorite, uh, find the cryptography, strong encryption for browser-based transactions, business-to-business -business encryption tunneling, IPsec, say PKI. These are all essential because the one key on all of this is any data transfer um, encrypted in transit, encrypted at rest. Um, it's essential. Now, there is a defense in depth um, um, idea, policy, standard um, concept, of course, that if you encrypt traffic internally, therefore your IPSs uh, become less effective. We certainly can cover that, but for the most part, from a transactional basis, uh, everything should be encrypted. It should be encrypted well um, with certain key sizes. We all know that. And then certainly um, certain ciphers that are relevant, um, Diffie Kelman, um, uh, things of that nature, um, elliptical curve. There's a number of them, um, SHA-256, uh, all of them uh, from a hash perspective. But encryption is the lifeblood of all transactions. And hence, the stronger and the more focused that you put onto that, um, the PCI standards from 2.0 to 4.0 certainly push that. And there are now new pieces to 4.0 from the encryption as far as what to encrypt, when to encrypt, how to encrypt, that um, may be a little bit of an update from, from uh, the last version of version uh, 3.2 from the DSS, but um, it's been around for a while, and then certainly um, I think everyone on the call, or at least should be, aware of the importance of encryption. All right, and again, please uh, put questions in, and we'll cover them at the end. All right, moving on. Give me just a moment. The new PCI 4 requirements and how they may benefit organizations. Um, I'd like to cover what I think is, is the, the two or three major issues in 4.0 um, that I think are important. There are certainly others, and I certainly won't um, try to, to cover all of them, but I prioritize a few here, and I think that, for at least my perspective, I think they're um, the most important for, for today and for 4.0 as it goes forward. And again, uh, to provide flexibility for different ways entities may meet security objectives, PCI 4.0 includes two approaches for implementing controls, and validating PCI compliance. Entities should identify the approach or combination of approaches best suited. Now, the defined approach has been um, bread and butter for PCI and all auditing for some time. Again, the traditional approach for implementing controls and validating PCI compliance, um, it is what entities have been doing for years to meet PCI. This approach will be using the requirements and testing procedures defined in the standard. The entity implements security controls that meet the standard requirements, the state requirements. The assessor allows the defined testing procedures to verify requirements are met. The defined approach is very straightforward. Um, here are um, the 12 or, or however many, um, um, if you will, uh, controls within the standard, the PCI standard, and how many are in scope, and then producing things such as show me your standard, show me your encryption, show me your logs based on um, standards, um, and especially logs, show me your logs for 90 days, show me your logs for one year. Um, certainly, uh, that's been around with PCI for some time, and that certainly is with 4.0. Um, 
And again, if the NTBO has controls in place that meet PCI requirements and is comfortable for an approach, there's no need to change. But as we move forward, the defined approach is giving way to, to what will come up in just a moment of, of a more machine learning, artificial intelligence focus, and applications that um, perform these duties um, in a way that's different than historically done. And it appears, at least so far that I'm I research, that more and more uh, version 4.0 and transactional industry is going away from the hands-on manual defined approach of here's my standard, here's how I deployed it, um, here's who's accountable for it, here's the logs accordingly, uh, to a more method, a more advanced, if that's a relative term, but I would say a more advanced method and methodologies um, where you're allowing your software to do much of the heavy lifting itself. We'll cover that, but that's a direction that, and we'll get to in just a moment, that I think more and more that's where it's going. Now, compensated controls. This is a pretty straightforward one. My favorite example of this, if I could very quickly, is um, FMI, excuse me, on the, um, file integrity management. Many organizations, at least many of my clients, um, historically do not deploy um, FMI, uh, excuse me, FIM. And so um, they don't have the same capabilities, but FIM basically does logging of, of, of who you are, the account, time stamping it, your source IP, um, and things of that nature. Now, compensated controls are, they're doing the same thing. You've got um, Active Directory accounts that are being logged, timestamp, um, where you're sourcing from. Um, but with uh, file integrity management, for example, compensated controls, um, you're able to go ahead and also capture uh, the script that, that's been applied. Um, that's a very nice tool, but it's, it's, it's an expensive tool, and it may not be relevant for many of your organizations. Uh, the compensated controls that I've always seen is, you can do all that and then work your way backwards to if you're looking for changes that are potentially unauthorized or authorized. You'd be looking at, say, my change management ticket. All right, I've had a potential breach or I've had an alert generated being reviewed by my security operations center. They see that, that someone has logged in to systems that potentially they don't have authority to log into. And they're logging in at, say, a time frame that is, is, is concerning or, or um, gives a moment to pause. Um, you now would theoretically you'd go look for a change ticket that would be relevant to that. If there is no change ticket, it certainly could be nefarious activity. It also could be unauthorized changes. Hence, compensated controls. If I don't have uh, file integrity management and the script that's put in there, I can work my way backwards and gather most of that data. If you've been through PCI controls and PCI audits, um, you probably have dealt with this, so I'm sure I'm probably preaching to the choir, but it's something to keep in mind. Now, the reason that this is historical approach is because it's been part of DSS for since 2.0, and, and it certainly is today. But the next step here for 4.0 is really a customized approach, and, and I'd like to spend a little bit of time here. One, to provide flexibility for different entities and security objectives, entities should identify an approach uh, that are best suited to their needs. Understood. But a customized approach is really what our friends at, at PCI, it looks like, are moving in the direction of. The 4.0 is not doesn't require it, and again, I want to use the term required very carefully, but it is more and more being stated as a best practice. Okay, the customized approach is this approach allows entities to implement controls that meet the requirements stated in the customized approach objective in a way that does not strictly follow the defined requirement, providing greater flexibility to entities that choose to implement innovation approaches or new technologies to meet these uh, objectives. Again, if you're looking at the, the, the controls, um, it states this is the evidence we need. Um, you're looking in the end to get that evidence, but you may not be pulling logs accordingly. You may be running applications in the future that would allow you to gather that same data um, in a very different and, and if you will, novel, um, but more likely a futuristic way. Um, because gathering it manually is, is labor intensive, it's expensive, and if you can automate that system, which it appears that more and more transactional financial services companies are doing themselves, but also that um, transactional services companies are asking um, PCI and their vendors. Um, uh, it's, it's probably well known to many of you that the large card uh, processors and the large card issuers are pushing very hard at PCI to automate as much of, of um, their uh, best practices as possible. And this is one direction that they're going. For example, some entities may wish to supplement legacy scanning for internal vulnerabilities 
with modern machine learning techniques such as user and entity behaviors and or AI based probabilistic, excuse me, probabilistic, probabilistic, sorry, approaches for detecting advanced threats to the cardholder. Um, I can say that in my graduate studies right now, I spend a lot of time going through logs. Um, I pull the logs, um, I parse them accordingly. Um, with um, some of the stuff that I've seen and some of, of, of the, um, if you will, uh, applications um, and, and, and proof of concept, um, the reports that are generated are producing as much, if not more, of the evidence that I'm looking for, but in a very specific and automated way. More and more, uh, again, my opinion only, but the industry and PCI seem to be going in that direction. This is the future of, of, of PCI, if you will, auditing. This is a potential future of how you might be running your business related to gathering data um, and to running your business from an InfoSec perspective. Um, again, let me re reiterate this. Supplement large scanning, or excuse me, legacy scanning for internal vulnerabilities and modern machine learning techniques such as <clears throat> user and entity behaviors and other uh, probabilistic um, approaches. Um, more to come on that because um, we don't have that much time, so I don't want to go into too much depth. But I would strongly urge you to go ahead on the PCI site and other sites and start doing some homework and research on what does a customized approach really mean and what does it mean to my business. All right, moving on. And again, I want to keep moving. Um, implementing controls that are validated and uh, validating PCI compliance. I come back to the same one I just approached because I think this one is just so fundamental. Um, the compromise approach is an alternative to defined approach and focus on. Again, it's greater flexibility suited for organizations that want to use internal, excuse me, alternative security controls or new technologies to meet the standards customized uh, approach objective. Um, the importance of the entity and, and assessor collaboration to ensure the assessor will fully understand the controls designed by the organization. But also, again, full circle, this allows to automate and having a customized implementation that is properly thought out, documented, tested, and maintained by the entity will facilitate an effective customized assessment approach by providing the assessor with the accurate detailed information about how the controls work and thus in turn will help the assessor determine the appropriate testing and necessity to validate implementation. You'll be producing reports that are of more value potentially, but certainly make it easier to prepare for an audit. Um, more to come on that um, as PCI 4.0 um, is implemented. Again, moving on, challenges that may face the PCI 4.0 uh, organizations. And again, all organizations update the security controls um, before March. And I want to emphasize um, version 3.0, um, version 4.0 is fully implemented and by 2025. Um, and again, to address um, threats experienced by the payment industry, uh, there'll be increased requirement for two factor. I can't emphasize that enough. New password requirements or passphrases and phishing requirements. You will be asked to go ahead and run more robust phishing programs. Uh, to introduce more robust security measures, a special guidance to make it easier to understand new security standards, of writing your standards so that they appeal to a larger audience, if not just engineers, but more business people, especially with the board of directors or management that's reviewing and approving these, the more clarity, um, the better it's going to be. Transparent and detailed reports and help people understand the areas that they need to improve. And then finally for this, promote innovation in the payment industry to make the sector more flexible, Offer risk analysis to have organizations set the frequency of executing certain security operations, customize security standards, changes in permissions. And again, changes in permissions are essential. Um, lease privilege and segmentation of duties, uh, segregation of duties um, will become more robust. Certainly expect that from 4.0. All right, moving on. And again, a um, little bit of time here. I want to make sure that we can catch up real quickly. Um, summary of changes. Uh, the core for security control protocols has changed. The network security protocol has launched in place of firewalls and other traditional security measures. I can't emphasize that enough. Firewalls are more static, and they certainly were all aware of them. They can be beaten, um, and, and implicit deny rules um, can be spoofed. Um, nefarious people are accessing it through existing um, um, ports and protocols. This allows for wireless security technology to be implemented. That means deploying security measures as a defense in depth but not just relying on firewalls, and I can't emphasize that enough. The focus has shifted from the default security practices to more advanced security configurations, dynamic configurations. 
Can they learn? That's been the big question, still to be determined. Changes to make account data more secure, that's coming into it. Uh, less access, and, and if you don't gather it, you don't have to store it, you don't have to secure it. A smaller potential footprint. Improved crypto, that goes without saying. Updated security practices from the designs from malware and other. More and more, they're getting away from antivirus and going to anti-malware. You'll see that in the standard, and I really would like to emphasize, please review those standards and updates, because more and more, it's going to be how is your antivirus malware system working? And you're going to be expected to be gathering more information, um, potentially um, larger and, and maybe um, out of scope historically from the antivirus. Again, audit logs um, in place of audit traces, that goes without saying. The new corporate programs focus more on IT. Um, you've all heard this, but let's be clear every company now is a software company that does transactions on digital. And so, by that nature, um, how to ingrain IT and InfoSec into all aspects of your business. And again, to reiterate, as we talked just a moment ago, multi-factor off uh, MFA has become compulsory in areas that historically it has not. And again, um, PCI 4.0 aims to address the feedback from financial organizations and authorities. It further protects, uh, it furthers protection of data of new controls. The financial industry is the catalyst behind 4.0 and the ones that are coming because they're the ones paying the losses. And so they would like to see more robust security measures. And again, steps to prepare. And really, this is, is, is the last slide and the last question. I can't emphasize this enough. After 4.0 was launched, PCI it will be operational for two years. And 4.0 was launched in March of this year. The transition period from March of this year to um, March 31st of 2024 is intended to give the organizations time to familiarize themselves with the changes, update their reporting templates and forms, and plan implement changes to meet the updated requirements. Um, this seems you know, just a kind of a nebulous statement, but the amount of work that's incorporated there will be significant. Um, multi-factor just alone. Besides multi-factor, then um, moving towards a customized objectives instead of, of direct objectives and direct gathering of data um, cannot be emphasized how much work that may be and how much costs accordingly. But again, I want this timeline you know, by um, March 31st of 2025, um, all requirements will become effective, meaning any audits as of April 1st of 2025 will be 4.0 only, if not 4.1 and beyond. And then version 3.2 will certainly have been uh, decommissioned. Moving on to the last slide for this, just a moment. And again, just reiterating here, as of 31st of 2024, uh, 3.2 will be retired and PCF 4 will be the only active version of the standard. However, 3.2 will be valid for two years until it is discontinued. That will be then 2025, the final date, but certainly by 2024. Allow organizations time to grasp the changes and apply necessary uh, adjustments. Assessors can undertake um, assessments using 4.0 or right now using 3.1 uh, and completing the 4.0 training as they go. In addition, PCF 4.0 gives organizations more time to implement its numerous and requirements. 4.0 is, if in my term, and this is my term, uh, I'm focusing more on the automation and the future of automation within um, transactional and transactional compliance testing and compliance um, certification. I cannot emphasize that enough. With that, that's a lot very quickly. And so what I'd like to do is, does anyone have any questions? Could you type them in and we can chat accordingly? Um, my information is in the slides. Please feel free to, go to, to reach out to, a, to me if, if you do have questions. And again, last um, couple of slides real quickly. Practical advice and solutions to implement and, and comply with the standard. Um, GT, ITG um, offers a variety of, of programs and, 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 and offerings. Um, gap analysis service, compliance and audit, uh, uh, report on compliance, implement training courses, and document toolkits. All of great value, all based on 4.0. Um, I have gone through these programs. I think they're of great value but they will certainly help the organization who is either new to PCI to, to understand and to move forward, especially in the GAP services, but also existing uh, PCI uh, clients uh, who have experience here, but um, would like to have a, a consultant's view um, because the changes here are going to be significant. I, I can't emphasize that enough. Please download the 4.0 and review it yourselves, but I think you'll find comparing that to um, 
of the delta that falls out between 3.0 and 4.0 or 3.2 and 4.0, there's some work that's coming. With that, I want to thank everyone today for joining us. And um, again, are there any questions that I may answer? Um, and again, you can get in touch with us. Um, we would love to, to, to chat with you about uh, opportunities that we may be able to, to fulfill and requirements that you may have. Um, again, PCI is transactional-based um, clients and platforms. Um, it's only growing. Um, if it's 82% 80, of Americans today, they're expecting that to be well close to 100 um, as, as younger generations who are more familiar with the technology, who are more familiar with, with using uh, mobile devices as their primary um, uh, modes of communication. Um, and, and as many of you know, now I have to uh, just digress for a moment. Um, my children don't, haven't made a phone call on their phones in some time. It's all about texting. Um, mobile platforms is going to be the future uh, in no uncertain terms. There will certainly be others, platforms, of course, traditional, but for the most part, mobile um, and what requires for mobile can only be expected to grow. All right, so let me go back and we've got two more slides. Um, questions. And again, I want to thank you. So um, does anyone have any questions? And, and is there um, any issues you have or anything that I might be able to help with? What kind of encryption should be used? That's a good example. Oh, that's a good question. The question from an encryption perspective is, what is your, your platform? Is, is it, and again, what kind of encryption should be used? Um, let me just go ahead and make sure that I understand the whole question. Okay. And who is responsible for implementing the security control? Well, quite honestly, um, it's going to be um, um, you. It's going to be the organization and the client. And so, um, for example, uh, if you have people coming to your site, um, who are using browsers that are out of date. Um, you will interrogate their browsers. I mean, of course, this is already being done. Um, and then push an, an email back to them or push a you know a radio button that comes up or, or even a, uh, a pop-up saying, your browser is out of, of compliance. We cannot move forward with the transaction. Please update to any recommendation to, um, to um, Google, Sun, or Chrome. Um, to Brave, um, uh, to, uh, to Duck, um, to, of course, Edge. Um, that's who'd be accountable for that. The question from encryption also is then um, pushing back on them on what version of TLS. As I'm sure most of you know, TLS 1.3 is just around the corner. Many organizations are already rolling it out, like you know, the old um, version 6 for, for uh, TCP. Um, and then there's also white papers on version 1.4. Um, but certainly then let's take a step back. Um, encryption from that perspective, um, certainly TLS 1.2, 1.3, um, and then the um, lack of support or the refusal to support uh, version 1.0, which is not secure. But also let's talk about ciphers. Traditional ciphers um, are, are more and more becoming um, legacy, if you will. Uh, Diffie-Hellman, elliptical curve, uh, hashes such as uh, JAW 256. So again, there's a number of, of, of from crypto or encryption um, requirements, um, but who's going to be accountable for that will be the, uh, the entity you're, such as yourself who is taking the transaction, pushing back to your client saying, by the way, you know, this browser, <clears throat> excuse me, is just not in, in, in service, <clears throat> excuse me, is not in compliance and, and needs to be updated. Uh, that should be expected that you'll get some pushback and some clients are upset about that, but bottom line, this is a dynamic moving target. And, and if you don't stay current, uh, both by the end user like myself going to uh, my processor, um, then it's on me that um, I am not, but it's also then on my processor to say, if you're accepting um, um, encryption that isn't strong enough, um, you know, um, fool me once, fool me twice. Um, it really has to be done accordingly. And again, the onus will fall on the end user but quite honestly, it is the, at least in my opinion, and certainly in PCI, it is the transactional acquirer or it's the processor that needs to make sure that their clients are aware and not accept um, potential risks and vulnerabilities 
on encryption that is not strong enough. All right, give me a moment. I hope that answers your question. And again, who's responsible? Um, the end user, certainly, but um, I would certainly put that it is um, the processor as well, because it's going to be um, your certification that PCI will come back and say, you know, best practices, did you do this? And there's a good possibility that the, the card um, issuer um, may say, I'm not going to cover those losses because just something to keep in mind. All right, with that, I don't have any other questions. Let me just check. All right, and if there are no other questions, I want to thank everyone for joining. I know we've gone over a little bit um, and wish them a good day. Um, and then I'll end the webinar, but I want to thank everyone again. And please, we'd love a chance to chat with you about some uh, doing some business with you. And our uh, offerings, I think, are of real value. Again, I'm John Tracy with ITG. Thank you and have a good day.